So, uh, so the introduction I have uh, for Louise, so she's Associate Director of the UK Data Services, uh, as it says in her programme, which is bringing together digitally enhanced, high quality, older, da older data sources with high profile users, but also lots of less high profile users. Um, she heads the functional area of collections, development and producer relations. The latter meaning she's responsible for ensuring ESRC grant applicants and award holders gain good advice on creating shareable data, which is particularly relevant to those in the audience, I think. Um, her specialist interest is qualitative data, uh, which has always posed big sharing problems, as was referenced earlier with the interviews and other things, um, and has previously worked on the British Household Panel Survey which is now included in Understanding Society, which is, has some of the finest data access documentation known. So I recommend you look at that stuff because it's really, really good. Anyway, without further ado, this Thank is Louise. Thank you. So I just want to, my pre to preface that I'm not a qualitative sociologist. I'm not how I define myself. I'm not sort of a bad thing, but I actually am a trained chemist. So I'm a mm. chemist by training. I then became a research methodologist and a survey methodologist, and my skills really lie in survey design and analysis. But I got into qualitative research 10 years ago, so I'm a bit of an all-rounder, so I'd like to think that I can uh, you know, cross the disciplinary uh, boundaries because they do exist. Um, so I'm going to talk about motivated experiences for sharing data, and I'll tell you a bit about how we've, how we've managed to do that and, and how we've accumulated a lot of evidence and, and good knowledge. But I really want to think about these things. It's really about providing safe access to data, um, being very aware of the Data Protection Act, but at the same time um, thinking about open science and open transparency and all the things we're hearing about today. And there is always this tension, and there are pathways through that tension. Um, and it's often about having the arguments and having the robust guidance and the procedures to be able to show people that they can trust what you're doing. Uh, and the trust thing is very, very important. So I'm going to show you some examples of what I think are the most difficult uh, things that we've archived over the last 50 years, um, and an example of quantitative and qualitative. Um, and then I'm going to really talk a little bit about how one might help em empower our data owners to think more better about sharing. And I think many of the things today are going to elucidate that too. So um, we all want to do science, although actually many qualitative researchers don't define themselves as scientists. So some of the paradigm things we're talking about this morning, they don't do science, so they don't do falsification, so they don't do transparency. So it, it's whether you're an artist or a scientist. I think that debate... I've actually accused um, qualitative peop people of being so, uh, scientists and they've thrown tomatoes at me. So I think <laughs> there is something about whether you define yourself as a scientist or not. But I do think most disciplines do have a scientific approach. Um, there's many benefits to sharing collaboration, as we know. And we want to be good. We want to get more funny. We don't get the naughty girls and boys letters that you get from ESRC if you don't share your data. Um, and then on the, the, the other side of that, and actually having time to do things is that it's really hard. Some data is really, really difficult to share. We wouldn't advocate sharing some of it. You know, it can pose a risk to the participants and, and researcher too. Um, and then there's the, there is still an unwillingness to share. I think we do encounter it. I'm sure you all encounter it. And it's often for a variety of reasons that sometimes make sense and sometimes don't make sense or sometimes steeped in disciplinary tradi tra traditions. But having been in this role for 25 years, it was much more prevalent in the early 90s. Now, I, I actually hardly see any of the... Uh, no, they won't understand that. That kind of I, I do think that, that um, that's changed quite a lot, which is a really good thing. But I think it's changed a lot in the UK, maybe not the rest of the world. We are world leaders in data sharing, and we should be very proud of that. And uh, you know, if you go to France, it, uh, very, very little data shared. So we are in a privileged position that as researchers, we can gain access to data, and we're sharing a lot more too. So I, I always say that, that you know, it's not just about disciplines, it's about the UK base as well. It's very important. So... Let the counselling begin, because it often is like a counselling session. I'm sure those of you involved in extracting data from people, it is like, right, sit down and we're going to help you through this. So, um, it, of course, don't dismiss a data problem. You know, if you're, you're black and white, so of course you can share, everyone does. It's, it's never true. There's always nuances there, and it's being very aware of that. Um, and their perspective is meaningful to them. They've been through the painful process of collecting and extracting it and working with, you know, in difficult scenarios, so we shouldn't underestimate that. So there is always something that can be done. That's my position. Whatever you've got, there's always something that you can share, even if it's a protocol or something. It's, it's not nothing or, or everything. It's, it's something. So it's a good guidance. So, and then we ha all, clearly all have a load of incentives that we'd want to reel off to persuade people. So um, the counselling session uh, shall begin. I'm just going to say a little bit about my own data service so I contextualise how we, how we provide the advice. So um, we run the ESRC, ESRC data policy, um, which I helped write apologies for any ESRC people in the 1990s, which means you have to share data at the end of your grant, 
and qualitative data and anthropology data and everything came into that remit in about 95. So it really opened up the policy. So we have, after three months, you offer data. If you don't, you know, you have a negotiation, then, you know, there, there's some kind of pathway for that negotiation. Um, we also do a lot of line catching where there's really good data sets out there where we actually go and uh, make, make an approach to say, you've got a really fantastic survey, shall we work with you? So there, there's a number of approaches that we actually deal with in-house. And then sometimes we do get presented a really, really good catch, you know, on a plate to say, we've got this stuff, would you like it? So there's a whole loads of things that we're doing from persuading and cajoling through to welcoming. So it's quite a wide approach. So just to say, we, not me personally, but um, some of our teams have been around for 50 years. Very early adopters of data sharing in the UK from the 1950s, mostly polling data, um, you know, surveys. We've had a formal relationship with the Office of National Statistics since 1970, which means everything they collect after six months comes to us. So it's a very nice engagement with surveys, which most countries don't have. So we are very fortunate to have that. Um, and we have some of the best social surveys in the world, very high standards. So um, a really fantastic research base here. Supporting the data policy and then um, thousands of researchers. Um, you know, there's a lot of good knowledge that comes out of working with people every day. So for us, it's all about this network of trust. You need everyone to trust each other. There's a cycle of trust. You need to trust the standards you're using. You need to trust, um, you know, the, the subjects that are giving you reliable, accurate data. Your funders need to trust you. So there's a whole load of trust things surrounding this. And I won't go into standards, but we have a data seal of approval that many archives are using to show that you are trustworthy. Um, so just to say some of the things I think that really help persuade or give a very good a, a kind of trust is all the things that you have in place to show people. We have policies to do this. We have um, various protocols and templates to help you do things. Um, for example, we have sort of draft um, legal agreements and draft consent forms people can use. Um, incentives for sharing, there's, there's lots of incentives we can offer people or show them and they're written down in a nice way. And of course, expertise and experts in-house. But if you've got all these kinds of things, then it's much easier to proceed with your, with your mission. So um, these are documents that many people around the world have used. We have a collections development policy that's five pages long that sets out our development policy. We have a, a, a quite a straightforward appraisal and selection criteria, which every data set comes through. And it looks at research value. It also looks at the shape of the data and long-term <coughs> value. And also um, develops a pathway for which route that data is going to take. We have many different publishing points, some lightweight, you know, some just for uh, maybe embargoed for 50 years. Everything has a pathway as it comes through. And it's up to experts to make that decision, discussing things with the depositor and working with the data itself. And then we have an appraisal group that helps make those decisions. So it's very formalized. And actually, when we talk to people, we say we have an appraisals group and the form looks like this. And actually showing them that there's an auditable, transparent process, I think, actually is quite a nice thing. It, 20 years ago, we didn't. We just used to say, yeah, well, we'll have a look at it. And then sometimes they weren't responded to. So it helps you keep track of the things coming in. So um, I think the most important thing for people is operationalizing access. And um, we did this about five or six years ago. And a lot of places now have used these three categories. Um, and it's really with discussion with ONS that we came up with this. So open is truly open. Safeguard is some, so you've got some registration in front, but it's, again, quite lightweight. May have some additional conditions put on there. And then controlled is kind of lockdown, safe room, secure access, whatever you want to do. So those three, those three things are very useful. So when we negotiate data with people and they're really worried, we'll talk about various options. Um, and sometimes they will give us three versions of data, depending on what the, what the end point is. But it's nice to operationalize that in a really clear way, and people understand that. Um, so just in terms of data coming in, we have a whole series of standard licenses, very standard, and quite often a depositor will come along, like from the BBC, and say, well, we, we use our own license, we don't, we don't want to use yours. And they'll give you something really complicated and say, you know, we want to look at every press release you do about our data, really restrictive things that are impossible to manage. So we say, no, you have to use our license, and then we can put a couple of things you want um, as an appendix. But I think, you know, it's really important to have a license. That's your standard template that everybody uses. And offer flexibility, but only in terms of, uh, you know, adding to that. So that's been one of the key things for us to actually help streamline things and get people to say, OK, I've got to fit in with your criteria. So agreed timetables we will always have a very clear understanding with someone about how long it's going to take and what the timelines are. And I think if you don't do that, it's very complicated because it could be open ended or they feel threatened that they've only got a month. So negotiating that as part of the process helps people. It's a little less pain painless, actually. 
Um, and then we tell them exactly about the quality assessment techniques that we're going to use to look, look at and evaluate data, and that's helpful too. And then there's standard deposit metadata like we all do, and, and that helps for them to fill in a standard form as well. So just one of the things we've encountered time and time again is people saying, I can't possibly share that. It's really sensitive and it's really personal. But they are talking about the topic, a very sensitive personal topic, and I'll show you one in a minute. And it really isn't about the, the topic necessarily. It doesn't mean that it's sensitive personal data from the Data Protection Act, but it's a very sensitive topic and they're deeply engaged with it. But the data they're getting could be actually quite, um, it, 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 couldn't, it might not be disclosive at all. So it's sometimes trying to say, look, we know it's a really sensitive topic, but the data are not sensitive. And, and actually, that's a very important distinction to make. And the first thing we say when we train, sensitive personal data means this. It has an absolute definition. It doesn't mean that every single pe thing that you've done is personal sensitive. So that's quite an important distinction. So you've got to deal with the personal sensitive data properly. We, we know that. Um, discussing the consents you know, what, what's gone on with consent and how that can be operationalised is very, very important. Um, offering these multiple pathways, which might be controlling access, anonymizing, or there may be an open version they can create. And as a very last resort, um, we do discuss sort of permission and extra conditions to access data. But we used to offer that straight up front to say you can choose any of these and everyone chooses the most locked down because they just do. So we now actually open a, offer a fairly open license and then people have to ne negotiate up, which I think is, works very, very well. So um, just to think about, the, the, we have a lot of the, the really important surveys that ESRC spend millions of pounds on and they're the, uh, the longitudinal studies and the cohort studies and there's quite a number of them if you don't know mostly based at the London universities and, and Bristol as well. So we have uh, the Millennium Cohort Study, the National Child Development Study, the 1946 birth, birth cohort, um, the 1970s study, and some educational studies. And they're really big cohorts that have been followed through, and they're world-leading as well. So most of them actually have fairly open conditions. They're just safeguarded, and any researcher can use them. And they're, they're, they're quite complex data sets because there's many, many data sets. Some have genetic data with them, some have other forms of histories. They, they really collect everything about people over the life course, so you can imagine they're complex. Um, so it's not the kind of thing, you know, an undergraduate downloads and uses. They, they do have a complexity about them. Um, but one of them is uh, there's quite s linkage going on. So sometimes they, they get permission to link to administrative data. And just an example there is um, there's hospital of birth that's been collected for the cohort members and that the typical safeguarded version it has coded hospital. So I can't remember what the codes are, but they're coded and they're not disclosive. There is a version where you've got the name of the hospital that's completely disclosive um, and it hasn't been coded. And that particular version of that data set is put under um, special license. So you need to go through a whole load of extra um, steps to get that because it's a lot more sensitive. So multiple versions of data depending on the sensitivity. And then um, we do have a secure access one, which is our safe room, which is locked down. You have to be a safe researcher, an approved researcher. Uh, you have to have your outputs checked. It's quite, quite a lockdown procedure. And again, that's some, some linked data with uh, pupil records, and they're quite disclosive. So, so they get locked down um, with, within this environment. But again, just multiple versions of the same data linked to more difficult things. And uh, we use this thing called the five safes framework which allows you to have safe data, safe projects that go through an approval mechanism, uh, safe settings where the settings are safe um, and are not connected to the internet, um, safe, safe people who get an approved researcher status and they've gone through training about disclosure risk, and then safe outputs. So the outputs for your PhD or your publication are vetted by a team of experts. So it's a very expensive process to do that. It's something like 27 times more expensive than having just a safeguarded version of data because of the human input into that process and negotiating with the data owners and, and having that. But it's really very useful for policy research, so um, th there's a value in that. So um, just caveats of locking down. It's very expensive to lock things down. Everyone wants to do that, but you have to realise the administration <coughs> that goes with that. Um, the future proofing, if, if you're in a repository and you get data from a depositor in 15, 20 years time, I can guarantee they'll have moved on or they don't care and they won't give permission. So it happens very quickly. And every 10 years we go through a process of trying to get back to them and at least half of them are not there. So we're now trying to prove future proof that to say you can't just give your name as a permission owner. You need to give us an access committee and an email or some other proxies. And that works quite well, but, but it really is quite scary how quickly people's emails and contacts go out of date. So. And we have gone back to things that were negotiated with very complex access conditions, 
20 years ago and had a discussion. Of course, the person was more open and said, well, why did I lock it down? I don't know. So it, it's the renegotiating and showing that actually it's OK to do that. So I've got two qualitative examples I'll take you through because I think they're interesting sort of policy data sets. So this was a really interesting qualitative study done during the foot and mouth crisis um, in Cumbria in the early 2000s and um, it was funded by the Department of Health because they were looking at some of the health impacts and mental health implications of the foot and mouth, foot and mouth crisis within communities. So they had a panel of 54 people spread across, you know, frontline workers, medical people, farmers, people, you know, vets. And they um, kept quite detailed diaries for 18 months. Um, and they, you know, observed life about them or asked to think about their mental health and stuff like that. And then they did in-depth interviews and group discussions. And so there's a lot of data coming out of it. Um, and it was really valuable data. And they produced a report that the Department of Health didn't like very much because it really pointed to the fact that there wasn't enough frontline support. There wasn't a thinking about the long-term mental health of these groups. And it was a bit dismissive of, um, of the NHS and the way that the things were being handled. And actually, it has, um, it, it's, it's moved forward. So there's now strategies in place for dealing like crisis <coughs> like this when we have them. So um, they hadn't even thought about archiving or sharing at all. But they thought, we really want to share this because the stories are very important. And they wanted a public resource as well as an archive resource for researchers. So they came to discuss it with us. The consent form, the consent was not in place. It would have been absolutely impossible to share that information. So. What they did is um, had some discussions about get consent and actually also um, engaged with the panel members on the kinds of things that would be meaningful to them, sort of anonymization, consent, what it means to you, how do you want information to be shared. It's a really nice in-depth study of what consent means. Um, and then they gave them various options to archive things. Now, the only unfortunate thing they did is to give them a date when their data might be open or closed, which is very hard to administrate. And we did say, you really sh probably shouldn't have done that. You should have offered 5, 10, 15 years, not when do you, when do you fancy opening it. So that was a bit, <laughs> a bit of a lesson <laughs> to think about. But it, it, you know, the, the point was they gave people choice and it was negotiated. Um, so each archiving was discussed. And the end point of that was, I think, out of those 40, 53, 40 of them were actually archived and just put under standard access conditions. Some were embargoed for a period of a few years. I think it was 12 or 10 years, actually, by the time it came out. And some didn't want to at all, which is fine. And they may be the most interesting ones, I don't know. But, but they had the right to say no, because you are doing retrospective content. And then the audio files are permission only. They didn't want to release them. But you can go back to the researchers and, and listen to them. And the forms that the retrospective consent was for all kinds of data. And they've done a fantastic user guide, actually, which actually talks about the steps they did and to gain consent. So it's worth having a look at, because it was written it's not typical research documentation. It's actually put together retrospectively for the purposes of showing how to share well. So it's actually very, very good. So the other one I want to talk about is a very sensitive topic. But actually, the data was shared very straightforwardly. And just want to give you an example of how that, that can be done. So this is um, a researcher who's done a couple of studies on, this was about deep sedation practices um, at end of life care around hospital beds. And apparently there's not a huge controversy, but actually it, it's a topic that's, I think, not agreed. The methodology is not agreed by absolutely everyone. And there'd never been any quality to work to see what people thought about it or how they made decisions at those points. So um, they, I think it's a school of nursing where she's based. They did um, a series of really in-depth case studies with uh, clinicians, nurses, family members, and uh, people who are, who are around and, and, and involved with that end of life care. And they wanted to look at clinical decision making. Um, and of course, it, it is terribly painful because people are dying, you know, at the, at the end of their life. So it, it's difficult for everyone. Um, and they had a very good framework for ethics review that they've shared as well of part, part of documentation about how they managed to do that. So um, it was an ASOSI grant, so they were expected to share it. But actually, unlike some who come to say, I want a waiver, I can't share anything, and then you enter into the counselling and negotiation, they actually said, that's fine, I want to do that, just tell me what I can do. And we'd looked at the data. And interestingly, although some of the demographics they had about the hospital and the place and the disease, a lot of the other stuff to do with the discussions were fairly, I'm not innocuous, but they weren't terribly disclosive. So I needed a small amount of anonymization to remove the hospital name and you know, some of the family members' names. It was quite straightforward and I guess quite generic because this probably happens a lot. Um, so the anonymized transcripts were shared and they're available to everyone. And actually, it's been used quite a lot in terms of how you approach this kind of clinical decision making um, because some of the outcomes are interesting. So um, 
we're going to ask her to write a case study on this because she's one of the few who don't balk at the idea of sharing things like this. So it's, it's just quite interesting and she's very open-minded and it sometimes is to do with people's personalities. I'm sure we've all found that. Some people are willing to share their last Rolo and some clearly are not. So it, it's very open-minded and saw the value in, in what she was doing, particularly as this is a very hard-to-reach population. So it's not easy to get through the gate to do that and you spent a lot of time getting through ethics review interviewing in that scenario is very very you know quite rare and you're unlikely to go and do it again so actually making that data shareable is really really important because it has very high value so that's just in reshare our self-deposit repository um, we didn't do very much to it she'd done most of it so she had a bundle of zip files and some documentation and the protocol as well it's just all uploaded so um, and it's a creative commons attribution license too okay so um just a bit about our de self-deposit repository. So we do operate two strands of work. One is we have what's called our main collection, where all the very large surveys, um, you know, the, the disclosive stuff, the, 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 big, the really big studies that are very expensive go one route and have a different team working on them. They get a lot more effort put into documentation, checking, cleaning, publishing data. The other smaller research stuff that's not government-funded or large-scale funded, so definitely under a million pounds, most of these, they're quite small, they go through our self-deposit system, and there's almost a 1,000 in there now, so they, they do pile in quite quickly. Um, and people, as I said, we're very lucky in the UK. We do have a constant stream of stuff coming in, whereas I know some of the other self-deposit repositories in Europe for social science are very slow to fill up. People are still not used to doing it. So we've, we've come a long way in the UK. So some people need the hand-holding and, and, and the discussions, and some just don't because they've got enough information. But I think however much information you put up, course the more you put up the more complex it is and you try and find that balance about making it easy giving some prompts within the system and having some user guides it's still very hard to to, to, to get guidance on the whole on the whole area because we're dealing with very quantitative things through to very very qualitative anthropology things as well so the guidance isn't always the same and there's a lot of advice on what you should upload what com how do you contextualize raw data what, you know, how much methods and protocol do you, do you used and, and your, your talk this morning about, you know, kind of context and methods. In the publications from these uh, data sets, there's very little on methods, you know, it's like half a paragraph on methods. And even in books nowadays, you don't get the same methodological chapters you used to do 20 years ago when it's very, it's quite indulgent about the methods. <coughs> now you get a very clinical, sanitised version of what went on that probably isn't true because it's never that easy. And actually, in the documentation, sometimes that does come out more. So, so people are more willing to talk about the sampling and the weighting and how, how they got through the door and the problems and issues. And I think we do encourage people to do that. But again, it does take time. So if you're really short of time and moving on to the next grant, then it, it often is quite a quick and dirty process to get data deposited. So it really does vary hugely on what people are prepared to do to publish their data. Um, so we have one repository administrator who's a junior researcher with a master's in social science and she can have the conversations, she's actually a political scientist, she can have the conversations with the political scientists who don't want to share their data or the qualitative people and, and she's very good. So well, I reckon one in ten are relayed up to my team who will deal with more complex issues where she doesn't feel she wants to get into an argument with a professor. So quite often it's going up the food chain a bit to, to, to negotiate or talk. Um, but, you know, it's not a huge resource to do that, but actually you can do quite a lot because of the other things surrounding, because of the kind of advice and the formats and things surrounding that. So we have a very good query tracking system where everything goes in, the queries, so they can be monitored and picked up by other people. So it, it's quite streamlined. So if someone's asked a question last week, it'd be picked up and relayed. And, you know, the communication with that kind of thing is very important because people get very upset if they're not, you know, paid attention to, and that, that's fair enough. So I think something to do with the way that you're auditing what people are asking to meet their needs, I think is, it's more satisfying, really. So another sensitive case, we've had two of these, actually, and uh, they're people who, one's an anthropologist, one's something else, but anyway, they've done really significant research over 50, 40 years and got millions of pounds of funding from the SLC, and they never share anything because they're just too important to share it, and they've never quite finished analysing it because it's a life's work, so we can respect that. You might have gone to Africa and collected data on something that only you really understand, so sharing that becomes hard. Um, no, 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 you know, I'm still publishing. And then, literally, the minute they retire, <laughs> they come knocking on our door with, like, by the way, would you like everything we've got? And, well, no, not really. <laughs> so, I don't know if other repository managers have had this, but there's this assumption that now I've finished, you can have everything, but of course, it is sometimes a whole room full of paper and notes. And it's really how you then deal with something like that, because actually you need resources to do it. So, we actually don't have resources to do that anymore. So, we ask them 
to maybe find a researcher to sift through anything that might look like research data, not personal papers or love letters or whatever it is in there. So, um, but actually, we have got really reprimanded by them for saying no. So actually, sometimes saying that it's not good enough or no, making that maybe value judgment can be really, really difficult because people get very upset and they say, well, he didn't want my data, they didn't want my data, so I wouldn't, I wouldn't bother. And you don't really want that to happen. So I think we do try and refer, we'll probably give it to the University of Cambridge or something. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, they've got a load of boxes. Um, but there is often really high value stuff in there. So we have done it where we've gone through um, Peter Townsend's research from the past and pulled out four data sets that were in these actually that was a hundred boxes and he was very nice but and we knew it was coming but we did pull out the kind of research elements and they gave the rest to the library who looked after the all the other personal papers so that was worth doing but it's a very expensive process to do and we had a grant to do it because he was very important um so you know physical offers it, it, do you want them do you not it, it's difficult because there's a lot of really valuable stuff from the past which might merit a data rescue project but it does almost need separate funding and and it can be incredibly valuable stuff, but it needs, you know, digitization program and everything. So we're a bit, you know, it depends what it is. If it's high value and we can get more money, then we will do it and we'll get a team in to do it. So we, we never really say no completely, but I think it's, it may be doing it in conjunction with, a, with the university library. And as I say, you have to just be a little bit careful sometimes. So we'll say, yeah, we'll scan a box for you and put that up. And <laughs> but I think actually in terms of that, in the past, we were offered lots of boxes and things, and, th and they pile up, and you can't do everything with them. But actually, I think we now realise, or realised a while back, if you just digitise some of the good stuff and put it up there in a catalogue record, people can see what it looks like. And then we've had about five or six scholars, including some from Cambridge, come to say, I want to digitise all this myself. And they've put in the money to do that within their own grant. And they've you know, rejuvenated the collection and given it back to us. So that's a really nice mechanism for saying, I don't need to get it all ready. I'll get a little bit ready and show you what it looks like, and then you can come and use it, and you're promoting it. So actually, it's quite a taster, really. If, you know, data from 50 years old that no one's looked at, of course, you know, <laughs> people are going to jump on it. So it's quite a nice thing to do. So just some key messages from that. Um, it is all about negotiating, understanding what's going on, being able to send out people who can discuss the research approach, because people really do want trust in the person they're talking to. They want to un understand that you understand that they're, they're problems and issues and uh, appreciation about you know, the Data Protection Act and all what it means and all the, all the legal aspects need, need to be known about, but it's distinguishing what's sensitive and what's not sensitive, and that can be... I mean, it should be quite clear, actually, according to... If you, if you know the legal definitions, it should be. And again, flexibility. So I, I don't think it's all black and white. It's having a discussion about, well, what can we do together and, and making sure we're saying, no, you don't have to do A, B and C. You can negotiate a little bit. But again, the more concrete advice and scenarios you can point people to or say, actually, we've got a data set just like that. Go and have a look at it. This is how they did it. And pointing some really good examples of data, I think, are very, very good. So um, we do point to those. We, we often say, go and, don't, go and look at this. And that can be quite inspiring for people to say, oh, right, OK. So um, just say, you know, to be in this business, you need to love research data. and <laughs> You need to be really positive about it, not just think, oh, God more research data. But I think everyone here in the room actually does love research data. So just showing you a little bit about what our self-upload repository looks like. It's very straightforward. Most people don't have a problem with it because one needs to make the interface quite straightforward. The problem is what you put in there or whether it's data and documentation can be the most complex thing. So um, we do try and uplift the information beforehand, but you'll all know that people don't read things at all. So there's a, a balance between you know, in-system prompts Make sure you do A, B, and C, but not too much, because then if you block people too much, it's, they'll just give up and switch off. So having, we have very explicit guidance on what we're going to review when you put it in. So if you've seen that and you haven't done something, you know we're going to pick it up because we're reviewing it. And then guidance on what you're supposed to do and step by step. And one would hope if you, had, if you did read those, you would have a really painless experience, but that's not always the case. And they're just available to look at. We do quite a lot of training and webinars on how to publish A, B, and C, or how to share qualitative data. Um, and a little bit more we're doing with um, what's the difference between a transparency data set and a, a, whole collect, a whole data collection, and how do those two fit together. So that's quite important. So um, as I said, most, most people are quite happy. It's mostly quite good data and documentation, surprisingly, uh, although people are very limited with their time. But there's always a few common things that come up every single time that uh, actually are uh, we did a complete review of 900, and it's the same things coming up time and time again. Really silly things like, well, not silly, actually. Really no, no documentation at all, which actually is not particularly good. Um, very limited descriptive metadata, very little on the methods, so you don't really know what they've done. 
Um, very poor file naming, which surprises me these days. And I think if you're going <laughs> to teach your young people things, they should know how to file name because it's awful. What was, what was your example? Uh, Nightmare. Nightmare. Well, well, that's quite a good file name because they version controlled it. <laughs> 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 uh, but uh, there is something about that. And then sometimes it wasn't clear what the relationship between what they said they were going to do, what they did, and what the data were. So I think trying to make those links um, would be useful. So they're, they're just the key things that came out. Every, everything else was fairly good. Um, and, you know, we do normally try and get back to depositors and, and have a conversation with them. Again, the README file is absolutely critical if every repository has that, but they really do vary. And pointing people to a really good README is quite good too because it really helps them to say, oh, I know exactly what you mean, not just a README file. So there's a danger sometimes to be templates and people copying them directly and actually the headings. So sometimes it's guidance on what they should write. And we do have quite a few alerts within our system, uh, reminders to say, you know, make sure you don't add dis make sure you've checked for disclosure risks, things that pop up. And then, you know, we, we, of course, we will talk about the benefits of sharing. And then uh, we do have our best data collections on the front page so people can see what they look like. And we are, we've been toying with the idea of giving them a star, but it's, it's a very difficult thing to do because it can, be, it can be negative as well. So we haven't quite done that about what is it, what deserves a star and what doesn't because most data collections are really good in one area and not so good in another so we're still doing a lot of scoring of things but we're not quite ready to think that whether they they get the quality stamp of approval yet because that's once you've got that then that's difficult and people say exactly how do i get that so we will be doing it but we haven't quite done it yet and that's just an example of we point to a really good one because their their documentation was great and the, and the P, and actually the it was a pdf documentation which isn't ideal but at least they've got documentation and we point to good ones from Oxford, not Cambridge, I'm afraid. <laughs> not the Cambridge one. Um, and to say, it's sort of, I think life at the front end of repository management, it, it, is very, it can be very frustrating sometimes, but it can be funny. You, it is incentivizing, actually, and it is, you know, a lot of customer relations and a lot of, but actually, all in all, it is quite a positive thing because it, you're doing good for, you know, society and research as well. So, um, but but we, we feel that it's m many of these things, it's quite a complex role. Uh, but you've got, to, you've got to actually really like doing it, I would say. So don't put any moody people on your, <laughs> on your front desk. <laughs> <laughs> um, and just to say, we've got a whole load of resources, uh, like um, videos and things and um, lots of things on metadata and stuff. I'm not going to go through them. You can have a look at them. Um, and quite a lot of websites that have done <laughs> stuff. So, it, you know, it's been doing it for a long time, and I think every time you rewrite something, it gets a little bit better and a little less content. And I, I think, you know, we, we did that with our book that we published a couple of years ago. It's quite streamlined uh, narrative about data sharing uh, for Sage. So, um, yeah. So that's, that's me. <laughs> Thank you. Right, we have time for questions, and as per my blurb, can we have some younger folk, please, who want to ask questions? OK, so. Thank you for the really interesting talk, which is a cliche to say. But what about the data sharing of tomorrow? Now, people wrote letters 50 years ago. Now I write emails. By the time I have to retire, I don't know what it's going to look like. Do you mean sharing, uh, you mean sharing letters? What, what kind of letters would you mean? Do you mean kind Archiving of any kind of electronic documents. Right, okay. Yeah. So I think there's a difference between records management and the core business of organisation and what you're, what you're saving for the future. And certainly the National Archives are, are going through that discussion now about it's very easy to expose politicians' papers and communications from you know, the 30-year rule. But actually, when it's all digital and emails, it becomes really hard. So I don't know if there's any one answer apart from best practice in, um, in records management. But I think research data is different to records management. And I still think there's that aspect of whether you're using blog data or Twitter data, you're still collating and collecting and documenting it somehow. So I, I'm not sure if they're the same things. Um, if you ask someone to write a letter as part of your data collection process, it doesn't matter if it's email or not. It's still a piece of text that you're going to bring in and analyze. So do, I'm, not, I'm not quite sure what, which bits you're asking there. Sorry. I think you answered my question. Okay, yeah. I think there, there is definitely um, improving understanding of how you do records management. I'm sure there's librarians and people, records managers in the room who understand better, but there are ways that you can zip up emails and, and think about um, what communications is business and what's personal, because I think it is much harder to do them with letters. Um, and I'm not sure if any organisation that I know does it really, really well. I've, I've never seen an exemplary one that, that is really good at that. So. Um, 
Uh, there's a question behind you. Yeah. Um, <clears throat> um, I'm wondering uh, how, uh, uh, how to plan for um, ethical implications of uh, new ways to de-anonymize uh, individuals that, that were part of studies. Uh, where you know um, previously you know uh, you had just had lists of personally identifying information that you, that you just had to avoid publishing, uh, but uh, uh, in more and more we're seeing that through uh, machine learning techniques and such, uh, it's actually possible to uncover the identities of uh, individuals based on uh, other kinds of data that they provide, and yeah. uh, presumably in the future the uh, the people might be able to go back. Uh, and uh, further de-anonymize uh, yeah. people yeah. from data that was vetted and cleared as being, you know, all right. I, I think you're right. It's an absolute challenge. I don't think there's any one answer to that, actually, because I think in time, because there's so much information that's freely shared on the internet, there's nothing you can do if you really wanted to do an intelligence piece and link everything together. You probably could, but I think we can only do what we can to keep safe the bits of data that we know about at the moment. So there's good disclosure risk tools for survey data that help you look at permutations uh, of, of variables about your own traits and whether they're similar or not to someone else's to help you treat the data to top code it or take the outliers out or treat it. So I think statistical tools are quite good. On the textual side, there's still a lot of tools and we were working with the National Archives recently on using t uh, text mining tools and, and text recognition to look at you know, personal identifiers in the data and maybe redact those. But again, nothing is ever completely automated like that. I think it's more likely to be automated tools with suggestions because it's still impossible to, to, to you know, disentangle absolutely everything. But there's very good text mining tools and entity recognition tools that will help you do that. But I've not seen anything in full production that works perfectly. So I've seen a lot of, um, I'm sure Google can do it actually, <laughs> but um, there's a lot of, uh, the National Archives are probably quite far ahead. But I haven't seen it done systematically like to government records because that's exactly what they want to do. Because I know with a 30 year rule with government records, they get groups of retired people to read through all the communication and redact it. And that's very, very expensive. And it's all done with paper. But once you get to the digital thing, how can you run you know, machine learning through that to help you do that rather than play, use lots of volunteers to do it? So I think, I don't think we're there yet, but I think you're absolutely right. We, we can certainly get semi-automated tools to help point to things. Yeah, there's more questions about. Hi, as you said before, um, some people are not happy to share the data, even if it doesn't contain sensitive information or anything like that. But from your experience, what are the most common excuses or arguments for not sharing the data? What, what, do, what does come up more often? I, I think what comes up more often is I haven't got time. And actually, people genuinely haven't got time. So you've got three years. You're spending all your money on your research officer to prepare the data and get the publications done. And also as much field work as you can, because nothing's probably gone to plan. Things have gone over time. Doing something in three years, we all know, is very hard to do. So I think often they run out of time, come to the end, expected to share. And then they have to, the, the, I don't know if you've applied for grants yet, but it is, it's a terrible process. I mean, it's, and it takes every bit of effort to do. So I think they almost put aside that and say, I haven't got time now, I haven't got time to go back. And with all the best intentions, wanting to do it, it's different from actually doing it. So you get people right at the end who, who kind of want to, but just can't. And then some people just say, I just, it's just not important, I need my next grant. So that's the biggest one. The other one is I'm really worried that no one else will understand my data. And that's particularly, we found in the biomedical, epidemiological very precious and understandably so because it, it's difficult data but really complex data collections around the life course and different measures for, for cohort studies if I give it out there people will misuse it and they won't understand it properly and I need to be there with them so they end up having their name on all the future publications and their model of sharing tends to be more collaborative where you come in to work with a team so that they're the two main things there's very few people that say I'm just not willing to but there are some but not many but I do think it's about time having time to do things rather than I don't know how to do it. I think maybe 20, 30 years ago, people said, I just don't know what to do. But I think there's enough guidance there. And it really is about, often people say, if you can help me, if you've got some resources to help me anonymize things or work on it, then I can. So it's much better than it used to be. I think in the UK, again, we're very lucky. Um, and people have to share anyway. So uh, <laughs> that's not much to it. And just to add on that, I think one issue also that prevents, yeah, data from being more widely ex uh, accessible is also that basically researchers don't want to do the job twice because most have them on their own personal web page and uh, why would I ever you know have an incentive to if it's voluntary 
uh, to put it on some other national yeah. Yeah. Uh, archive, uh, unless uh, it's really kind of weaved into the grant applications and grant requirements yeah. that you basically um, upload it. And also, I think in Switzerland now, uh, all what is funded from the National Science Foundation um, is also yeah, required to be uh, uploaded then after the, the grant. So I think, is there any technical way of, yeah, I mean of I connecting basically yeah. to the so personal I, I page? So I think putting someone on your webpage is, in terms of archival practice, is unacceptable. And most of the people who are going to talk about persistent citation would say <laughs> it's fine to do for a while for promotion, but it's, you can't find the data, you can't locate it. Your web, when you leave, your web server will be killed, the error will go. It's not sustainable at all, and we've got to think about the, the fair you know, fair principles, findable, accessible, um, what the, some repeat of whatever it is, <laughs> interoperable, <laughs> yes. Um, so it's something about provenance. So when I put that DOI in, in 100 years' time, people can go and find my data. So we often say that people will say I'm putting it on a website, but, but it needs to be sustainable. And, and it, it, it might be very simple. You've done everything beautifully, and it's just the sustainability. And maybe the formats, maybe you've exposed formats that are proprietary. It's about making sure they're interoperable formats as well. So taking them out of a complex scientific system and maybe putting them in an open format. So I think that that will be the answer is... What you be an open format, for It depends what it is. So a state of file a, it often would be converted to CSV with some metadata. So it is, uh, it is open at the moment, but in 100 years' time it might not be, but because there's so many softwares that import and export. But there's clearly some types of some, some of the qualitative tools, like in Vivo, Atlas, they're completely locked down proprietary and you can't get anything out of them, really, that's valuable. So most, form, most softwares do have kind of some kind of import-export, more than they used to, but it's about making sure you can make them readable in the future. If you think about the software formats we used 20, 30 years ago, a lot of them are not readable at all and they need to go through data rescue. So there is lots of published, um, we have them for example, tables of acceptable formats, preservation formats, and, and then user formats. And for example, like in audio, you, we use FLAC and OG, which are open source formats for audio files for the future, but we wouldn't disseminate in that, we disseminate in MP3, although not to the linguists because they get very upset that it's not high quality <laughs> enough. <laughs> but for your average social scientist, an MP3 is fine. So, but the preservation format and the access format can be different things. I think we have to wind up the questions, yeah. but before we do, which of the audience has data they think they still can't share, having heard that? Right, so let's have a discussion later on about why we think what's missing. Yeah, sure. Yeah. So, okay, so, so thank you very much.